Hey, Mark, how are you? I'm fine, Jamie. How are you? How's very how's good in thanks. North London? <laughs> yeah, we're doing okay. It's a rainy, dark night in North London. It sounds like it's a little sunnier and brighter where you are in Colorado. Yep. Colorado is one of the sunniest places in the world. So although it's January, we're still probably around 50 degrees Fahrenheit, whatever that is in Celsius. Yeah, yeah. Not a cloud in the sky. So it's quite nice. Thank you. <laughs> and a beautiful part of the world as well. I grew up in one of the flattest parts of England in a place called Norfolk, where we have no hills, let alone mountains. So, right. yeah, but I love the mountains. I love the mountains. So. Oh, that's great. Well, Thank you so much for making the time to join this sentientist conversation. The idea of these conversations is that they're, I guess, the two deepest philosophical questions, really, what's real and what matters. And this concept of sentientism that I'm trying to develop and popularise after the term was coined originally in the 1970s, is, as obviously you well know, is that it answers the second question, what matters, the clue is in the name. It focuses on sentience, the capacity to have subjective experiences and suffering, and that we should have moral consideration for all sentient beings of whatever type. And when it answers the question of what's real, it suggests we should take a naturalistic approach, that we should use evidence and reason to form provisional and probabilistic beliefs. But I'm talking to people in these conversations who agree with that philosophy and also disagree with it. We'll see where we go in the conversation. Okay, great. But before I ask you those two questions, for people who don't know you would you mind just introducing your life and your work and your focus it's quite a story so i'll oh, see how um, how, much, how expansive you want to be yeah let's see i was born in brooklyn new york in an apartment house and didn't grow up with any companion animals except the goldfish because everyone at the time had a goldfish in their kitchen and i used to talk to the goldfish but i used to talk to all the animals in the neighborhood and when i was a kid i would always be asking my um, parents what are the dogs and cats and mice and ants and birds thinking about and what are they feeling? So my folks say that what I wound up doing really is exactly what they expected that I would wind up doing. Right from a very early age. Yeah. And they said that I minded animals and it was, and I wrote a book called Minding Animals. And what I meant by minding animals, <coughs> excuse me, was that I minded them. I took care of them. And I also attributed rich and active minds to them. So from as early as I can remember, I never doubted that non-human animals were conscious and sentient beings. It just yeah. seemed bizarre to me then that people would question it. And it seems now today even more bizarre. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of bizarre people out there. So I think there's, that, uh, <laughs> there certainly are. And yeah. I think it's fascinating that you, I think many people start out where you do, that they have an intuitive sense of connection mm -hmm. and, uh, and, a, and, a, and an understanding of the sentience of non-humans but most of us are then very quickly indoctrinated and trained out of it but it feels like you just maintained that and kept it through your life but how would you describe what, what you've done with that in your professional life in terms of your writing or advocacy how would you i know it's hard to summarize but how would you summarize uh what you've done professionally in that context again just well, as an introduction really yeah it was anything but linear <laughs> yeah but I think I'm sure in the back of my mind, I always wanted to study animal behavior, ethology. I didn't know what any of that was when I was a kid, even in high school. I wasn't mm. a particularly good student, but that's what I wanted to do. So I never really doubted my early intuitions, if you will. And they were supported by my folks and some friends. Other friends thought that I was a little wacky, but that was OK. Yeah. And I really didn't have a linear path. I did a lot of different things. My first job after college was selling rock and roll records. And then I went to, I was in the PhD MD program for a few years that involved killing cats, which I didn't want to do. So I quit. And I had gotten my undergraduate degree at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. And, I, and while I was gone, a man named Michael Fox came to teach there. And he was studying the behavior of wolves, dogs, foxes, coyotes, and other con canids, if you will. Yeah. Uh, and he was right really in my camp. And I was always interested in emotions and animal play behavior. So really what I did, and I've, I'm still doing it today, decades later, was at first using play behavior as a window into what animals were thinking and feeling. Yeah. Uh, and, and would you say that's... 
it sent, uh, from having read and un- seen some of your work, it seems like that's been the guiding force throughout, has been, to the extent it's possible, really trying to understand the perspective of non-human sentient animals and genuinely try and get a view into their world, however partial. Yeah, back in 1974, Thomas Nagel wrote a book called What Is It, what, wrote an essay, What Is It Like to Be a Bat? Yeah. I didn't know about it then, but early in, in the mid-70s, I, I met Donald Griffin. And in 1976, he wrote a book called The Question of Animal Awareness. And we met and we really got along. And he was an award-winning science, a scientist, a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He's the man who discovered echolocation in bats as an undergraduate at Harvard. And we really clicked. We became really good friends. And we stayed in contact. And then he wrote a book in 1982 called Animal Thinking, and then revised it in the early 90s into a book called Animal Minds. So I was always interested in animal protection, I would call it. You could call it animal, well, I wouldn't call it animal welfare because I'm not a welfareist, but you could call it animal well-being or animal rights. I prefer animal protection. So I was always trying to put together what we learned about cognitive ethology, what's Mm. happening in animals' minds, to some kind of uh, practical use to protect them. Yeah, and that was when I when I look back, that was really a steady um, stream in my whole life. Actually, yeah, Um, that's the theme. Yeah, I thought I always thought academics should get out of the clouds and they that they that they have to use what they're learning on behalf of the other animals. And Michael Fox at the time was one of the leaders of not only in canid and carnivore ethology but also in animal protection. Yeah. So it's taking that academic perspective, but that it's applying it to activism and a practical perspective about how to protect. Yeah, using science, which I still do now. Yeah. There's pe- I, there's, there are people, colleagues, scientists, who don't agree with what I say, but they don't criticize my science. I'm not married to science in any sense of the word, but there's enough good science out there to warrant much more protection for non, you know, non-human animals. Yeah. And that perspective about science or more broadly a naturalistic perspective is one of the central questions I, I'm i really interested in mm. through these conversations, almost independent of the morality initially, just to think about what's the epistemology or what's the how do people decide what's real in the world. So for many people, that's a conversation about whether they grew up in a you know, religious or a supernatural context or a naturalistic or an atheistic context and you know how that view has shifted over time, if it has. It'd be interesting to know that story for you in terms of naturalism, supernaturalism, those perspectives. Well, my grandparents were Russian immigrants, Yeah, Russian Jewish immigrants, I didn't grow up in a religious home, although my folks celebrated the major Jewish holidays. Yeah. I didn't. I think I'm somewhat of an atheist from day one. Yeah. But not in a dismissive or, you know, negative way. It just just never dawned on me to take another view. Yeah. Uh, And in terms of the naturalistic view, yeah, I think when I was two or three years old growing up on the cement sidewalks of Brooklyn, New York, there were animals there. There were dogs and cats and ants and mice and various birds. And I just felt a real natural affinity to them, imagining, if you will, what it was like to be a dog or a cat or a bird or an ant or a goldfish. And I I used to say good morning every morning to the goldfish in the um, aquarium on my parents' kitchen counter yeah. because it was a requisite companion animal when I was young. But but my folks never they never criticized me. They never said, Oh, you're nuts. I I didn't realize how important that was until years later. Many yeah. years later, when before they passed away, we would have these really great conversations about non human animals and consciousness and sentience. What I'm doing today after many years is almost was blueprinted for me. That's the way I feel. It, yeah. It's in my genes. Yeah. Um, it's fascinating. And yeah. yeah. And and it feels like you're some people feel that they need a supernatural grounding or a religious grounding for their morals. And they're worried that if they lose that you, they won't have a foundation for what's right or what's wrong. But I, I think I share your perspective, which is there's just a direct sense of 
identification with the perspective of other sentient beings that recognizes that I don't like suffering. They probably don't like yeah. suffering either. That's the foundation for morality. What more do you need? It's a, a very common sense grounding, but it doesn't need much metaphysics. It doesn't need, you know, well, people is that, does that feel like it? Yeah. Yeah, people say, what school of philosophy do you follow? <laughs> and I said, I have no idea. I mean, yeah. I, I really don't. And I wrote a paper a few years ago because I made contact with a man called Roger Crisp, who teaches at Oxford, and he's really into a lot of practical ethics. And I read a paper by his, although I read some of his stuff decades ago. And that's exactly was that's exactly what his view was, that you don't need to commit to a school of philosophy in order to have a view of the world. Mm. My views were there before I was reading any philosophy or biology or ethology. And I think what you said, it's an identity and a feeling for. I really, my, my mom said I used to cry when I would see young animals, not young animals necessarily, but young animals being abused or animals being yelled at in the streets of Brooklyn, New York, which was not all that uncommon. Dogs being pulled on their leash, dogs being hit. And so it's hard, it's hard to explain it other than it's in my genes. It doesn't mean that I've been perfect. I've done things, I'm sure, and said things that I wish I hadn't. But I think the overall umbrella was laid maybe in my genes. I, I don't know. My grandparents were on my father's side had dogs, and they would talk to their dogs. And I don't think they, I, mean, I guarantee you, they didn't know what ethology was. Yeah, um, yeah. But they cared for their dogs. I remember that. Their dogs got well taken care of. And I always felt more at home with the non-human animals. I like well, people. I like non-human. <laughs> I just, I just, one of the last people I interviewed was Miko Yavampa, who founded Sentient Media. Mm -hmm. And he said as a child, his, his best friends were the sheep. Yep. So <laughs> He told me that. Yeah, I just never really made that divide in a sense, between non-human and human. I'm sure I did, but when I think back about it, when I was in high school, I wasn't a good student. I really cut a lot of classes, but I refused to dissect animals or piss frogs or, <coughs> excuse me, do any of those other things. Not because I was trying to be rebellious. It's, I just couldn't believe that this is the things, that these are the things that um, people did routinely in education. Yeah. And as an undergraduate, I wasn't really a good student. I was a, on the track team and I was an athlete, but I also just refused to dissect fetal pigs and cats. It just, it just seemed bizarre to me. I just, yeah. I can't describe it in any other way. And when I was in the PhD MD program, four of us refused to partake in any of the, they call them terminal dog labs and things like that. And the professor at the time was a world-renowned physiologist. And we thought we went in to see him, and we thought he was going to give us grief. And I don't, he's not alive today, but I don't, real, I don't think he really knows how he gave me license to live my views. But this was years ago. And when we went in to talk to him, we thought he was going to give us a lot of grief. We're in a fancy med school. And he yeah. said... Uh, he just was writing, and he sort of raised his glasses in a really professorial way and went, you don't have to do the dissections, just learn the material next. And here we were prepared for a two-hour debate. Yeah. <laughs> ready uh, for a fight. Ready for a fight. And then when I was partaking in some uh, cat experiments, running them in mazes, not the neurosurgery, I named all the cats. And I'd written about a cat named Speedo, who really was a fast learner. And I was told that you don't name these animals, they're numbers. Yeah. And my, my, what's that? They're subjects. objects, research subjects, objects who are numbered. You don't number companion dogs, yeah. you know? And so <clears throat> I remember going in and Speedo looked at me and basically said to me, why are you doing this? And I quit the program right away. I literally, yeah. he talked to me. He yeah. looked at me right in the eyes and do I really know what was going on in his head? No, I don't. But I think he was just looking at me, and the message I got was, wait a minute, you're my friend. You've been feeding me. You've been training me in this maze. It was no, there was no aversive conditioning. It was yeah. a food reward. And now 
he's strapped down and they're, they're going to kill him and look to see where the electrodes went in his brain. I just walked out and I don't mean that in any, I don't, I don't mean that in any, I don't know what the word is, arrogant way. Yeah. I just said, I'm not doing this. And I literally quit. So Speedo was my turning point. And at the same time, I had made contact with Michael Fox back at Washington University. And I don't believe there are coincidences in the world, but that was a coincidence. Really, I called him at the time and said, I went to Wash U as an undergraduate. You came back. I want to be your grad student. I've been in a PhD, MD program. I was teaching neuro neurology labs. And he had a PhD and was a vet. And the short story was, he said, I want you to be my grad student. And that's all it took. That was it. That was yeah. it. Yeah. And, and in a way, it's, it's not, I think you had a special level of identification with the perspective of these non-human animals and your companion animals. And in a way, that's not super unusual in that most people, there's the puppy behind me and most people with their companion animals can get that sense of compassion and empathy in a sense that this other being has a perspective that matters morally, really does. But our culture and our society, and I did this for many years myself, we seem to find a way of thinking very differently about farmed animals and indeed quite often non-charismatic wild animals as well. So at what point did you make that connection to farmed animals and animal consumption? And was that a difficult transition in your family or was that, again, something that was straightforward? Well, it's a good question. I mean, I really just had, I call it going cold tofu, not cold turkey. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, as soon as I started making that association, the real tight one between animal sentience, feelings, consciousness, emotions, whatever you want to call it, <clears throat> and wealth, welfare, well-being, I made the connection, and I immediately cut back my consumption of animals and animal products. Mm -hmm. And then it was quite a while ago when I just went to bed one night and woke up, and I thought, can't do this anymore. Yeah. You know, so I went vegetarian, I mean, literally overnight. It was easy to do. I raced bikes pretty seriously. I was a big eater. So I ate pasta. With It's not hard to be vegetarian or vegan. It just yeah. isn't. And so I did that. And every now and again, I might have a piece of cheese maybe once or twice a month. And I was honest when people would say to me, are you vegan? And I'd go, I'm not and I once for a month calculated what I ate. I really did. And my, my diet was 99.9% .9 in calories and food consumed vegan. Mm. But maybe once or twice a month, I would have a little piece of cheese. And then still quite a while ago, I just stopped. I just said, don't need it. And that was it. So, and I was traveling a lot. My goodness, I was traveling over 100,000 miles a year for a long time, fl flying all over the world. And people would say, how do you do that? It's so hard. And I'm going, what's so hard to have a salad, pasta, pizza with no cheese? I really meant it. I wasn't trying to be nasty to them. Mm. But that was the connection when I thought, do I really need that piece of cheese? No. Yeah. Now, there's one, there's at least a couple of ways people can challenge a sentiocentric way of setting our moral scope and what one we've already hinted at already was a more anthropocentric one where you say look actually humans matter or humans matter much more to such a degree that we're it's okay for us to mm -hmm. harm non-humans because either from a religious context we have dominion or stewardship or ownership or even a naturalistic stance which says look humans are clearly so much more advanced we just matter more maybe animals don't even suffer or if they do suffer their suffering doesn't matter and, right. and i think you and i just see no basis in that line of argument whatsoever Zero. these beings these beings suffer they clearly suffer there's yeah. no logical argument why that suffering shouldn't matter morally to us i think we can put that to one side although we'll come back to that because most of the people on the planet disagree with us so it'll be interesting to talk about how we can help shift that but there's another challenge to a sentientist scope which actually says it doesn't go far enough i'm an amateur in this field but my understanding the first use of the term sentientism was, at, I think, by John Rodman in 1977, and he was using it in a critical way. And he was actually saying Peter Singer's animal liberation is almost setting out a new form of discrimination that is discriminating against non-sentient entities like plants and rocks and trees and rivers. And he was arguing for a, a biocentrism or an ecocentrism that went even yeah. broader and said non-sentient things should have direct intrinsic moral value and it'd be interesting to know 
your perspective on whether yeah. that makes sense and and how you respond to that challenge or if you actually think there's there's some argument to that for me each individual's life matters because they're alive mm. so i don't say there that it matters because they're sentient or feeling beings mm. they're alive you can look at that in a number of different ways. You could say we don't know where to draw the lines and we get on a slippery slope. Mm. Um, or we can say it doesn't really matter whether they're sentient, they're alive, and they matter. So that's my take on it. But, so would you include plants are living things? So would you say that plants warrant direct moral consideration in the same way as a pig or a chicken or a cow or a fish? But I know the literature well for a number of reasons on, mm. you know, the latest stuff on the emotional lives of plants and that plants think and they can be conditioned. They, they mm. learn. I think that I'm not sure, mm. to be honest with you, I don't see anything that suggests, for example, that they feel pain as we yeah. know. Yeah. I, I, and I honestly don't know that. But I don't see that if you look at the neural architecture. My friends will say to me, well, you, do you think a carrot screams when you put it up? And they're saying it to be snitty. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I take questions seriously and I'll go, I don't know, but there's no reason for me to think they feel pain in an aversive way. Yeah. Yeah. And that's very much my personal view as well. Yeah. So, so sentientism doesn't say here's a list of things that are sentient it just says follow the science be prudent be probabilistic in a silly sense i'm i can't be 100 percent confident even you are sentient but i'm pretty confident you are because we share a common evolutionary history you know, i think you have a, an information processing architecture that's very similar to mine i can observe your behavior so there's a really strong base of evidence there that I can infer, I'm not 100% confident, but I'm, I'd certainly put you in the 99.9 .9 category that you and I are both sentient. And I think you can take that sort of provisional prudent approach as well. And to my mind, it, I think the scientific consensus is roughly that, you know, mammals, birds, fish, the more complex invertebrates, high confidence of their sentience to varying degrees. There's more research required on the really simple invertebrates and simpler animals. There are you know, a sea sponge, for example, is classed as an animal that has, as I understand it, no nervous system at all. But I'd go with your view for plants and trees. I think they can have complex behavior. They can communicate. But I don't think they have the correlates of any form of sort of neural style architecture that would give them a subjective experience of flourishing or su suffering. So they can be damaged and they could be and they can flourish in the sense of growing and procreating and living. Right. But I don't think they have an experience and to my mind, it's that experience, the quality of an experience, the suffering, the experience of suffering or flourishing, that's where the moral value comes from. And I think you're right. I think there is a genuine scientific interest in whether plants do have a subjective experience, whether Thomas Nagel needs to write a new essay about what is it like to be a tree. And I'm open-minded about that. But so far, I've seen no evidence that demonstrates they're likely to be sentient. And most people who talk about it, as you say, are of being a little bit snippy and trying to justify why they can continue to eat bacon. <laughs> yeah, not all of my friends, but many of them. But when then they'll say, what would you do? I, to be honest with you, I'm also more grounded and practical. So they'd say, what would you do if somebody showed that carrots felt pain? And my, my quick response is I wouldn't eat carrots. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. if they're shown to be sentient, yeah. And then they'll say, what about Brussels sprouts and potatoes and all that? And then to me, that gets into the absurd. It does. I'm not saying that the questions aren't important. They are very important. But I think you get to the point of saying, here you are eating your hamburger from a cow or your bacon or sausage or ham from a pig. Both animals suffer greatly on the way to your mouth. And we don't know about carrots, say. But I don't think it's likely that they have feelings of pain as we might understand them. Yeah. And if we learn they did, then you'd have to just find other things to eat, if you will, yeah. other foods to eat rather than things. I don't think pastas have feelings. I, I just, <laughs> yeah. I, and I don't know what, and see, 
that's why I'm, I'm more grounded in a real practical sense is, look, we know certain things about sentience in non-human animals. And that is enough information for people to change their meal plans and their attitudes towards non-human beings. Okay. Let's see. Let's keep doing the research. I never doubted that non-human animals had feelings. I never, it never dawned on me that an ant wouldn't have, a fe- have feelings. Mm. I mean, when I was a kid, I didn't know anything about neurology or brains. And I didn't yeah. care. But, but the fact that if you're looking at the non-human animals and the animal kingdom in general, the fact that they're alive, they deserve moral consideration. You know, the whole, the whole argument's about inherent or inherent value. Or intrinsic value. And I think this question links also to the broader perspectives of the average environmentalist or someone who's concerned about the environment. And you've done some fascinating work that I think helps to balance this because it might be unfair, but I would summarize the average environmentalist perspective as one where they've started from a concern about humans primarily because of the threats of climate change and environmental destruction mm-hmm. to humans and a concern for, you know, the human aesthetic enjoyment of the environment, because we like looking at it because it's pretty and we enjoy our wildlife programs. Because of that, they've jumped to a broad concern about ecosystems and environments and species Mm -hmm. and Gaia as an entity and rocks and rivers and trees and so on, which which in a sense is could be a positive extension of the moral circle. Mm -hmm. But it's quite often really just a reflection of a different set of human concerns. It's not really a genuine concern for the environment because in extending that moral circle, they've carved out many billions and trillions of sentient farmed animals and sentient animals in the wild as well. Um, So in a way, most environmentalism and ecocentrism is really just a disguise for another form of a anthropocentric, very human view mm-hmm. that some people seem more willing to grant rights to rocks and rivers as long as they can continue to consume animals that, as you say, really obviously are sentient. And I find that deeply frustrating. In a way, I don't mind if you want to go beyond sentience yeah. and extend your moral circle even further. Fine, but don't exclude any of the beings that we absolutely know are sentient. It seems a, str- right, right, a right. strange balance. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say when people say we don't know about carrots and go, we know well about pigs and cows. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I, exactly. I, I agree. And it is bizarre. New Zealand has a war on wildlife now with they're killing, murdering, slaughtering millions of non native animals. But a couple of years ago, New Zealand declared that all animals were sentient. And they are granting rights to rivers and rocks. Yeah. I'm all for granting rights to rivers and rocks. I'm they not need protection, for right? killing yeah. millions of non-native animals. They don't suffer any less than the natives. And then as a biologist working in conservation as well, when does a non-native become native? Some of the animals have been there for a really long time. They become part of they become parts of different ecosystems, and ecosystems are dynamic entities, they're not stable. So you go in and you kill these animals because they're non-native. You completely destroy the integrity of the ecosystem. And yeah. they, and by the way, they know that they suffer. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And we have, I think, from a sentientist perspective and an uh, environmentalist perspective, there's enormous common ground because even though personally I only see non-sentient entities, rocks and rivers and trees and plants, as having instrumental importance – that is a really critical instrumental importance because all of the sentient beings on the planet are intricately linked to all of those non-sentient environmental aspects. So just as an environmentalist would, I care really deeply about those things. And and I don't just want a cold technical set of ecosystem services to enable sentient beings to exist. Sentience includes a rich aesthetic sense of environmental flourishing and being at one with nature and all of those other wonderful things as well. So there's a lot of common ground, but I think you're right. There's there's a, this carving out of large tranches of sentient beings while granting intrinsic rights and protections to beings that just cannot suffer. Gaia is an interesting concept, but Gaia doesn't care. Gaia cannot suffer. Species can't suffer. Ecosystems don't experience anything. Mm-hmm. They're important, 
ways of describing things and grouping things and thinking about the complexity. But Mm -hmm. what really cuts to the chase for me is coming back to the perspective of each individual sentient being. And that individual sentient being doesn't care whether we call it a companion animal or whether we think it's a charismatic piece of wildlife or an invasive species or a farmed animal. Its experience of suffering or flourishing is, you know, is unchanged by human categories. And, and that's one of the fascinating mm-hmm. themes of your work has been this idea of compassionate conservationism, which is, mm-hmm. I think, trying to square that or balance that out by injecting in that perspective of the individual sentient and insisting on compassion as we go about environmentalism and conservationism. And Yeah, I've always thought about the importance of individuals, and that's why Jessica Pierce and I, in our book, The Animal's Agenda, developed the science of animal well-being, mm. which focuses on individuals. And one of the four basic tenets of compassionate conservation wow. is that the lives of every individual matters. The, the lives of every individu- individual matter. And, and animal welfare doesn't protect animals, really. It protects some animals, but animal welfare is really the philosophy is the costs, if the benefits to humans <laughs> outweigh the costs yeah. to the animals, then it's okay to do something. <clears throat> and if you look at different studies that have been done, field studies, field biologists, lab studies, where they'll say we met the standards of, we've met welfare standards, you go, really? In the United States, the Animal Welfare Act redefine the word animal to exclude laboratory rats, mice, birds, fishes, and invertebrates. Yeah. You, know, you try telling a four-year-old that or they're a rat <laughs> or a mouse or a chicken isn't an animal. And I, it, it's funny and somewhat sarcastic to say that, but that's what they said. And the science of animal well-being says every individual matters. And that's, for me, professionally and personally, that really tied into beginning and working really hard in the field of compassion and conservation. So once again, it's not necessarily driven by sentience. It's yeah. driven by the fact that each individual has inherent or intrinsic value and they deserve to live. And you don't, though people, and then conservationists will play the numbers game. They'll go, there's 10,000 brown rats, so it's okay to kill a thousand. But I always say, if somebody said there's enough human males like you that you don't, we could take your life, I'd say, no, thank you. The brown rats or the owls or salmon or any animal, the list of animals who are being slaughtered and killed all over the world is endless. And telling them that we don't really need you because there's so many more like you of your species is... (laughs) To me, it's bizarre because it totally ignores the feelings of the individual animals. And yeah. so it's a totally, I don't even know. It's hard for me to explain. It just, it just. I, I, yeah. I'm with you. It's so much of the bullshit just falls away when you take the perspective of the being that's under the oppression. And that works for humans mm-hmm. as well as it does for non humans, right? As soon as you take their perspective, all of these other questions about categories and aggregates and trade-offs, I'm not suggesting there aren't some really difficult problems where there are different individuals who have competing interests and so on and so forth. But some of the most important questions are really simple and straightforward. And in a way, that's the final section of the conversation, which is we're in this strange situation where I think many young children start out where you did, which is they're quite naturalistic little kids are almost quite like like mini scientists exploring the environment learning about what's going on testing things Mm -hmm. out experimenting in very simple common sense ways and then most people are taught either a supernatural or a religious worldview in my sense frankly they're taught to believe many things which have no basis in evidence or reason yeah but to the main focus of our conversation most very young people start out with a natural sense of compassion, not just with other humans, but with other non-human animals. And they recognize that they're individuals that can suffer and we feel a natural sense of compassion. But then nearly everyone in the planet is taught by society and parents that it's completely normal to harm and kill or have someone else harm and kill sentient beings purely for our pleasure. And that indoctrination is so thorough and so deep that it, still holds on to 
for me for many decades, right? So I need to remain humble as I'm talking to other people here. But even brilliant people, careful moral thinkers, advanced philosophers, moral leaders are still trapped by those social norms. So mm -hmm. we're in this strange situation where I think you and I share a sort of intuitive naturalism, an intuitive sense that the uh, the life and the experience of human and non-human living animals deeply, but most of the people on the planet certainly act as if they disagree. So in that weird situation, how do you think we can change that? And what do you think a world, optimistically, what could a world look like if we can persuade more people to believe based on evidence and reason and to grant moral consideration to certainly sentient human and non-human animals? How do you think about the future? And, well, I, I, and I'm pushing you to be more optimistic, but you don't have to be optimistic if you don't feel I am that optimistic. way. Friends think I'm crazy, but I am <laughs> pretty much a hopeful monster, if you will. I have to admit that over the last year, a lot of, I've had to, not fight, I've had to, I've checked into myself, but, but I am hopeful. I'm really a believer in the One Health Movement, for example. Yeah. The One Health Movement basically is arguing very straightforward that caring for non-humans is caring for humans. Yeah, and on that it's a win-win. Win-win. I, I really believe that. So I really like that movement. I think that if we really begin to treat non-human animals nicer, better, more compassionately, more empathy, with more empathy and respect and decency, then we will benefit from that kind of umbrella of compassion or decency or res or respect, for example. Or kindness. I really do. Um, I think it will improve human ethics into human eth ethics as well. Yeah. Yes, yes. And so I think it'll be a better world all around if we, if you will, practice what we preach or we walk the talk. That's not saying I'm perfect or anybody I know is perfect, but it really is saying that we've got a long way to go in terms of our moral compass and applying it. And a lot of people go, I know they suffer, but I love my burger. And I've used that quote in yeah. a book. And I'm still very friendly with the man who said it to me maybe 10 years ago. Slowly but surely, he and his wife are incorporating more vegetarian vegan meals into their day. I think the other way you can do it is I refer, because meals, food is really huge. It's who you eat, not what you eat. My friend once said to me, I know they suffer, but I love my hamburger. And we had a long yeah. talk about this. This is years ago. And slowly but surely, he and his wife have been eating a few more veggie vegan meals a week. And then I have these conversations saying that, think of it as who you eat, not what you eat. Yeah. And that changes the game plan. I gave a talk in Vienna some years ago. And after the talk, five women came up and we talked about it. And about a year later, literally... One of them wrote me and told me they all had gone vegetarian or vegan based on who yeah. you eat, not what you eat. Yeah. I'm not, it's a I radical mean, shift, isn't it? A simple shift, but a radical shift. Yeah, because who we, who, the word who has all the wrappings of sentience and feelings and all that kind of um, material. And that's what I talk about. And I've had editors want to change it. And I said, no, you can't. You can, I won't publish it. And the words we use, naming animals, he or she, not it, which, or that. And what's so frustrating is on Microsoft Word, if you use who to refer to a non-human, they try to change it to that. Yeah. And, and about, it was in 2010 when I was just finishing the Animal Manifesto, my book, I sat next to a woman on an airplane ride over to Europe and she said, oh, hi, I'm, what are you doing? And I told her I was editing, and, and I told her what I did, and I said, what are you doing? She says, she worked for Microsoft. <laughs> so we had, I wrote the story in my book. We had a long conversation, and she was really sensitive to it, and she said, I'll see what I can do. She may have seen what she could do, but they still don't she do it. <laughs> they still but haven't it was fixed great. it. I tried to explain to her that it's frustrating to me. Here I am editing a manuscript and word has changed everything from who to that or which or it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's fascinating because there are, there's the central moral argument and we know frustratingly it's hard to get people to change just with the moral argument because these social norms hold oh, us really hard. Absolutely. But, 
But subtle changes like that shift to who do you eat, getting Microsoft to change the, the, the language we use, if we can do that. But also, and you've hinted at this already, is I think when you decided to go vegetarian, then vegan, it may have felt daunting in advance. But once you did it, it was actually remarkably easy. And I felt the same thing. It was once you've done it, you're like, I wish I'd done that earlier. And it's only getting easier. And I, more hopefully, as the quality of some of the plant-based meats and the alternatives become more and more prevalent and cheap and available in a way like your friend it will just become easy and natural to remove ourselves from the consumption of animal products and as we do that it almost frees us to improve our ethics and i'd love it to be the other way around where you could just the sheer force of an ethical argument would just yeah and eight billion people would go vegan overnight but we know it's it's not enough you we're going to have to make it easy for people to switch and maybe that'll free people up to change their ethics in line as well. Yeah. I can't imagine it being easier. Yeah. I, I guess it can. You've got, I don't eat a lot of the fake meats and stuff. I just don't, um, it doesn't do anything to me, but yeah. they're available. And then you watch people eat a hamburger and they put so much stuff on it. They could be eating cardboard. They wouldn't know it. Yeah. But I think the food issue is interesting in, in the animal's agenda. Jessica Pierce and I wrote about it. It's so one thing over which people have control. And I've had people tell me that, <clears throat> not so directly, but they can decide who goes in their mouth or what goes in their mouth. Yeah. And it's one of the few things that a lot of people feel they have control over. Yeah. And maybe YouTube. I've been to, I've, I've been to gatherings where people don't know, say, that they're all vegan and they eat something and they love it. And then someone says, that was a vegan bratwurst or a vegan something. And they go, yeah. no way. And then invariably or almost invariably, they'll say, yeah, I knew there was something different. <laughs> and I'm like, I never say it because I'm not, I'm, I don't want to be that obnoxious. But I'll go, no, you didn't. You had sauerkraut and mustard and pickles and onions. You could have been eating, you could have been eating the bun <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with yeah. a sponge in it. <laughs> But I do think that the food issue and meal plans is huge because that's where so much pain and suffering and environmental damage goes. Agree. Agree. And, and yeah. even for, I like to joke that even if someone is one of those rare humans that has, doesn't care about non human animals at all, they only care about humans, there's still an incontrovertible argument they should give up all animal products purely because of climate change, zoonotic disease, antimicrobial resistance, human health. The pressure is building. There are so many reasons. So if we can open it up and make it even easier for people to switch, I think change could happen remarkably fast. So we'll see. And you, um, and your work has been a, a legendary influence in helping drive the human species towards a more compassionate place. So thank, thank you. you so much for that. Yeah. No, I think you're absolutely right. Although you and I might think it's easy and a lot of my friends who are vegetarian or vegan or who have made those changes later in life or late in life or early in life, it's been easy. I think we need to understand the psychology behind meal plans and make, and if you will, make it easier. Yeah. The, you, you said something before, a pure ethical argument doesn't cut it. Yeah. Uh, but I, will, I have a good number of friends who have decided to eat fewer animals or, and or animal and animal products, say, because of the ecological environmental effect. Yeah. And people say, some people say, I wish they wouldn't do it because of the ethics and the sentience. And I'll go, yeah, I do too, but it doesn't matter. They're, yeah. they're not, they really have cut back their consumption because yeah. of the environmental. The health aspect too, <clears throat> because you see all these just absolutely ridiculous articles saying humans have to eat animals and animal products. And, uh, okay, granted, there might be a fraction of a percentage of people who have some genetic anomaly that where they need it. Fine, let's put them aside. It's not a huge number. And if everybody who didn't have to eat meat or animal products didn't, then the world would be vastly different and you could put those small percentages of people aside who need to eat it physiologically or medically or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah. But I think that the the environmental argument is very compelling. The climate, you know, catastrophe climate change argument is. And then of course you have the denialists who don't believe anything. They only <laughs> believe what they they only believe 
what's right is what they do. <laughs> which which brings us back to the naturalism that's at the core yeah. of this idea of sentientism too. Yeah. Right? Ultimately, the best way of understanding reality is to engage honestly with it. But we know there are many people in many fields, including the political, who don't want to work that way. Yeah. Um, I'm aware I've used a big chunk of your time. Is there anything else you'd sort of la like to layer? I could talk to you for hours, but is there anything else you'd like to layer into the conversation? I made a little mental list and then I wrote it down. But then when I switched computers, I left it out. It's <laughs> just fine. No, we've really covered the ground. I really appreciate your um, interest in my work. And we really have. We've, you know, covered a lot about the sorts of ethical arguments people can make. They're important, but in the end, what's really important is what you do. Yeah. What your how your belief. I, what's the basic foundation for your beliefs? But I must say that I'm focusing a lot on, say, the tenets of science of animal well-being, compassionate conservation, and one health, because what marries them together is that individuals matter. And that what we do to help non-humans helps humans. And I think that's really because because there's a lot of people out there who would do more for non-humans if they could. We're, yeah. we're privileged. We have good lives. And yeah. they would, but they can't. So my feeling about it all is engage them, be nice to them, be proactive, be positive, be proud of what you're doing, set an example, and don't get into debates or these pissing matches with them. It's just, you're done when somebody goes on the defensive. So I have a lot of friends who are vegan. I have a lot who are vegetarian. I have a lot who aren't. And I don't treat them any differently. And like I said before, just talking to them and setting examples. I, I still cycle bicycle a lot. I yeah. just, you know, during the summer, I can ride up to 400K a week. And people will go, how can you be vegan? And I show them. No, but I'm going to leave you in the dust up this mountain. <laughs> no. Oh, no. I show them how I can. I show them my meal plan. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sometimes I leave them in the <laughs> dust. But it's like believing that you can do something and then seeing that it doesn't have a negative effect. And it really works. It really works. And it really works when you're if you will, you're nice to the people with whom you disagree and you don't get into these arguments with them. Because the minute people start arguing with me, you make this real split second decision. Can you change them? No. Are they going to change? It's been nice talking to you. You might be a nice person, but it's a waste of my time, in, in all honesty, to try to talk to you. You've got yeah. the basic ingredients for making the changes. and. It's up to you. You want to yeah. make them fine. If you don't, fine. But don't tell me that it's difficult, it's impossible, that you need this or something like that. Or don't doubt the fact that vegans and vegetarians can be physically active and mentally active and have very <clears throat> rich lives. Yeah. You know, get away from it. I agree. It. And I have to remind myself that if, if the concept of sentientism includes granting universal compassion to all sentient beings, the people I'm disagreeing with are sentient beings. I have to have compassion even for humans that annoy me <laughs> or yeah. even with humans that I disagree with. And, and that's partly because it's morally a better thing to do. But it's also more effective when you're trying to persuade, as you say. So I love those themes, taking the perspective of, of the other and the individual, recognizing that helping non-humans helps humans too, and having compassion even in difficult conversations. Yeah, it's an inspiration. Yeah, and a lot of people say, how can you work for non-humans when there's so many problems with humans? And there's, uh, I wrote an essay, I can't remember any, much about it or where it was published, but it shows very clear, clear, clearly that most people who care about non-humans care about humans. They just do. There is this universal compassion. And a lot of the attitudes of people who argue for ant, not, I could say, say not human animal rights also spend a lot of time arguing for human rights. So this kind of, and it's really a snotty criticism. Like, how can you, Jamie, care about non-humans when all these humans are suffering? And you go, I care about humans too. Yeah. And, and then people will say sometimes, do you want to say more? And I'll go, no, I have nothing more to say. For yeah. me personally, I've been teaching at the local jail for decades. I work with the homeless. 
I, it's not a feather in my cap is I feel for them too. I feel yeah. for human suffering too. So don't give me that crap that how could you work for animals when there's humans, so many humans suffering. But that's why I get back to the One Health movement. And even compassionate conservation will argue you take into account all stakeholders. But yeah. taking into account all stakeholders doesn't mean that the moral consideration of non-humans gets shoved aside. It means you yeah. work out solutions that take into account the well-being and the lives of the non-humans and the humans. And I see that as being really strong in the future because of all the young kids and youngsters and young people who are sick and tired of violence in the world, the violence not yeah. only attribute not only that's directed to humans but to non-humans so i i really do remain optimistic and i always tell people when they go god you must be nuts and i always say i may be but not on this at least that it'll take a long time it's not going to happen overnight but at some point i really honestly believe that every individual matters and what they do matters you show them that their points of view and their actions are important and slowly but surely there will be a sea change, and a lot of it starts <clears throat> really early in life, just really starts really early in life. So I won't likely be around for that kind of change, but I don't really care. What I really care about that we're on some kind of trajectory toward the moral compass, if you will, being inclusive of non-humans and humans, and once again showing how tightly linked they are that it's a win-win for all. Yeah, yeah. That's an inspirational <laughs> message. God. <laughs> Mark, thank you so much for the conversation. I've loved yeah. every minute of it. What's the best way of people following you and finding your work and reading your books? And my family are reading Unleashing Your Dog at the moment. So, oh, um, good. <laughs> yeah. Jessica Pierce and I, and I have a book coming out next October called A Dog's World. Imagining the lives of dogs in a world without humans. And people yeah. go, oh, wow, did you just start it during the pandemic? No, we started it years ago. So we're excited about that. And the best place to find out about me would be probably my website, markbeckoff.com. I'm not tra clearly not traveling now, but I've really stopped traveling by doing a lot of podcasts and interviews and webinars because I honestly just in addition to the maybe the environmental disaster flying, I just, for 10 or 11 years, I just was living in airplanes. And I don't regret it in the sense of saying, oh, I wish I didn't do that. It's fun meeting people. It's fun going to meetings, fun traveling all over the world and meeting a lot of non-humans in really far out funky places. Yeah. But I'm open to podcasts and interviews from the comfort of my home. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and I really appreciate what you're doing. I really do. I think what you're doing is, I think, the, I think a really, a real broad perspective on sentience and a lot of other, if you will, topics is really important. I, somebody, I'm not religious, although people say, yeah, you're religious, you're, you're religious about animal protection, but I'm not religious in, <laughs> you know, that in the typical sort of way. And we have to engage with religious scholars and religious people, too. And I've gotten grief from people about that as recently as a few weeks ago, because I post stuff to my Google group and people go, why did you post that? And I say, because I post a lot of things with which I don't agree. But the other bottom line, which is another conversation, is you need to know what your opponents are thinking and feeling. You, yeah. you need to know to mount if you will, a discussion or an argument to try to um, handle what they're putting out. And some of the critics are really bright. And, yeah. you, and you, you might learn something. It doesn't, yeah, I, I told this person, I said, you might learn something and what you learn won't necessarily make you change your worldview or your behavior, but you might learn something about what people who criticize you are thinking and maybe over time develop an argument that might deal with their um, resistance, if you will. Plus, it's yeah. just, to me, it's just fun to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I consider myself really fortunate to have 
studied wild coyotes and wild penguins in Antarctica and other foxes and dogs. Uh, yeah, exactly. And if we can't have compassionate, constructive conversations, how are we going to make progress? We're not, yeah. You can preach to the converted all night. But yeah. when I'd rather give talks, and I have both since the pandemic started and in person to, if you will, the unconverted. And just they're real people. They're human beings who deserve compassion and respect and to be treated with decency. But that doesn't mean you have to adopt their behavior or their attitudes. I think over the long run, it's going to take a while. And it's almost passe to say that people in the future are going to look back and say, how in the world did people in your generation or this generation do what they did? And yeah. that might be the case. but. We're alive right now, so just go do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it always social change always feels too slow when mm -hmm. you're trying to make it happen. But when historians look back on it, it's amazing how quickly <clears throat> things can happen. So I think you're right. Let's go do it. Let's yeah, go we've do made it. a lot of progress in the last 50 years. Have yeah. we made enough? No, not even close. Yeah. But we've made a lot of progress. That's why we need to educate the masses. I do a lot of work with Jane Goodall and her Roots and Shoots programs. I, yeah, love, with, I love working with youngsters. And so there's, just, there's no bounds to what needs to be done. And I think each person has to pick her or his area of interest and go do it. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> great message, a great message. <laughs> Mark, thank you. It's been a real privilege to talk to you. Thank you so much. You're a legend in the field. Oh. And uh, yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you, Jamie. And thank your listeners. And you can always contact me with questions, but you need to be nice to me and I'll be nice to you. Yeah. Compassion. <laughs> we'll be rewarded with compassion. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I will include the links to your website and your Twitter account and so on in the show notes. So people can click on those if they want to come follow you and read your books. So That's good. Thank, thank you. you, Mark. Thank you.